Good morning. My name is Isha Janjkill, and I'm a current junior in the hotel school and the assistant director to the programs team for the Hotel Ezra Cornell. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Roger Hill, chairman and CEO to the Gettys Group, and Mr. Ron Swindler, the chief innovation officer to the Gettys Group. Mr. Hill is a 1987 graduate of the School of Hotel Administration and has served as CEO of the Gettys Group for the past three decades, leading the strategy and analysis of Gettys development efforts, including the acquisition and requisitioning of assets throughout the United States. Most recently, Mr. Hill was named the 2019 Cornell Hospitality Innovators by the Leland C. and Mary M. Pillsbury Institute for Hospitality Entrepreneurship. Also, with three decades with the Gettys Group, Mr. Swindler directs the research, strategy, design, and experience pull through for projects ranging from restaurants and bars to lifestyle properties, events, and international brands. We are fortunate to welcome them back to HEC for their third conference. We are thrilled to welcome Mr. Roger Hill and Mr. Ron Swindler for a discussion about guests increasing reliance upon brands to help them make a positive impact on the world around them and how they've created brand experiences to deliver against that increasingly important need. Please put your hands together for Mr. Roger Hill and Mr. Ron Swindler. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure to be back as part of HEC. I'm Ron Swindler, and I'm Roger Hill, and I'm thrilled to be back as well. And really appreciate uh, the students and the university taking uh, the initiative to put together this virtual HEC. Uh, I know these are challenging times in our industry, but uh, as you mentioned, Ron and I have been fortunate enough to participate in HEC for the last three years. We hope we'll be invited back uh, next year and be on stage and be in a position to have an even more interactive session. But before we start our session today, I wanted to take a moment and tell everyone, uh, since we have been in this business now for three decades, and we've been through a few financial crises, we've been through a couple of Iraqi conflicts, 9-11, that this is a real challenge. I view this personally, and we do here as an organization, as more of a health crisis, and it's caused, obviously, a lot of challenges for many of us individually, our organizations, and globally, businesses to be stressed. But I see this as an opportunity every time that we've come through a crisis to come out stronger. And because of our culture at Cornell and the hotel school and our industry, we all have a high degree of empathy because we love to serve ladies and gentlemen in our industry. And I encourage everyone to take this time to be sensitive and listen to people and ask them about how they're feeling and, and take this as an opportunity to support and throw your arms around everyone to help them get through all this. And then when we do, I can assure you, once everyone gets done with their cabin fever, they're gonna get out of their house and they are gonna to wanna to travel. They're gonna to wanna to go to restaurants. They're gonna to wanna to go to hotels and our industry is gonna be better and bigger and stronger than it was before. And I speak to you from experience, as I said, because that's what's happened after every other crisis that we've been through. So with that in mind, we're ready to dive into our panel. And thanks again for inviting us. And uh, we look forward to you hopefully enjoying our presentation. Uh, just one social distancing <laughs> about throwing your arms around each other. Uh, by the way, those of you who have seen us speak before, uh, it, there are going to be some moments where uh, we let our hair down, so to speak, and uh, we enjoy this as much as hopefully you will. So uh, with that, let's move on to the next slide. Um, thank you for Cornell uh, for advancing our slides for us. So um, as many of you know uh, from hearing us speak before, we rely heavily upon research. Uh, in this case, I want to do a shout out to our partners at trendwatching.com. We have a strategic relationship with them. They do tremendous research um, on following consumer trends and guest expectations and they're one of the many sources we go to for kind of following um, the changing landscape around us. And today we're focusing on designing with impact in mind, which of course means um, the hotel industry can have an even greater impact than they are having around the world. And uh, we're going to show examples from other industries and other parts of the world that we hope might influence some of today's decision makers on future policies as it relates to the hospitality industry. I'll double blink like this when we need to advance the slides. <laughs> um, so uh, 2020, we're already in it right now. Um, and one of the things that we're focusing on is purposeful consumption. So what we mean by that is there are many ways that we can act responsibly uh, and affordably. Um, and basically, uh, down below, you'll see our note that says that 
it, it isn't just a matter of status to um, kind of be responsible for those who opt in. It's more a matter of shame for those who don't. So it's a tipping point. We've reached a point where uh, it becomes a consumer expectation that um, companies like the hotel companies are doing more. I'm double blinking. So we have two trends uh, that we're going to share with you today, and we'll get into more detail associated with these. The first is sustainability as a service. The second is intervention seekers. Let's move to the next slide and then we'll get to a surprise two more trends for you. Uh, the, the third is related to code breaking and setting new directions for new industries. And the fourth and last has to do with unconsumption rather than consumption. We'll give detailed uh, explanations of each of these trends as we move forward. So the first is sustainability as a service. And one of the things that we're seeing in 2020 is that companies have an opportunity to build services that are helping consumers or guests empower them to track and reduce their planetary impact. So we're measuring more and now we're providing not just data, but we're providing services to help people make a difference around the world. The first example is a company called Loop. Um, some people are certainly aware of companies like Net Nestle, PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, and Unilever. Um, and other household giants like Walgreens who have embraced a test right now uh, in a couple different countries on a zero waste solution as it relates to packaging. Uh, we know that a lot of household good packaging ends up in uh, recycling. We know that a lot of it unfortunately doesn't. And this is a zero waste solution that uh, has people come as a service and not only deliver things to you, but come and pick it up in order to try to uh, make sure that things are then sanitized and reused. They tested it in Paris and in New York, and we believe it, 100,000 people applied to have the opportunity. It's well oversubscribed, and one of the great things that they did in relationship to these industries is they created interesting containers that were highly functional. So haagen for example, has a container that's recyclable, it's beautiful to eat your ice cream out of, and it's designed for the top of the ice cream to melt a little bit higher pace than the ice cream below. So lots of great innovations, and I think something that you're gonna see applied to our industry, hopefully in the future. Well, I'd sign up if I knew I was getting special melting haagen -Dazs Exactly. Um, all right, moving on. It's much more fun, by the way, when we hear laughter in the background. But, um, <laughs> so the next company we wanna focus on is Foot Locker, who is trying to create sustainability as a service around incentivizing people to do more good. And as you know, the sneakerheads out there uh, are coveting uh, limited edition speak, uh, sneakers. And Foot Locker has created a program where you can only get access to the 400 new parlay sneakers that they just developed if you did good. And they measured it by saying you can help clean up a beach or you can go for a, a run where you've raised money through charity or you've watched an online video about cleaning up the oceans. And you know, it's a very interesting idea that in order to get access to something, you have to prove your worthiness. This right. isn't an idea that, that we're talking about for the first time, but it's an idea that leads to all kinds of opportunities for companies to, to establish their own policies similar to that. And you're de developing a deeper connection with that brand and relationship with that brand that's making that much Now you raise an excellent point because now it associates Foot Locker, not just the maker of the Adidas shoes, but uh, they're associating Foot Locker with trying to take a position for good. So exactly. um, let's move on, thank you. UpChoose is a fun new startup. It's a uh, European startup that is um, recycling baby clothing on a subscription basis. So you're essentially renting clothing and uh, returning clothing back to them. It's then reconditioned, cleaned, et cetera, and rented again. And, and you then get a discount um, towards your future uh, right. clothing that you rent through them. And the better quality you return the clothing in, the better discount you get. And uh, it's all organic materials. And it obviously allows you know this to have many uh, opportunities for use, and allows you to have clothing that's relevant, you know, from a fashion-forward perspective for your baby. Um, let's move on to uh, a Finnish company called Infuse, and what they're doing is they're sustain. They're they are measuring your carbon footprint, um, and that's tracking your entire CO two output of the production process, the shipping process. Uh, and it's really just another indicator of the Finns being ahead of things. Uh, shout out for the Finns, by the way. Um, no, it's a, it's a, just what, what 
we can now measure and track. And so this is a service that's saying, look, you want to actually know what your carbon footprint is as a result of buying these products? We're going to actually tell you. It. Yeah, whether an online purchase or you're just buying something at a store, they can tell you, you know, from a blockchain perspective, where that items come from and the carbon footprint it's put off to get to that store. Exactly. So what's next? That's next. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're actually looking at um, trends that intersect more than one thing. And in this case, it always comes down to basic human needs, the need for convenience and for positive impact. Uh, we've always been driven by the need for convenience, but positive impact is growing in its importance to consumers. And we'll show you some statistics around that. The first statistic we want to share is where the responsibility lies um, and the perception in the UK, according to Ipsos, is that 6% of uh, people think it's their responsibility to take a more sustainable consumerism and 51% think it's the primary responsibility lies with businesses. So um, that's shifting a lot of responsibility. I think the belief there is that uh, with with the profit, with the money, uh, comes responsibility. And with that in mind, I think we all have to think about our businesses and how responsibly we are acting. Let's move on to our next trend, which is intervention seekers. Uh, in this case, we're talking specifically about travel brands, and we're talking about ways that travel brands are stepping in to alleviate some of the guilt that people are feeling about travel. We know that carbon offsets um, New York to London um, are enormous, just one example of one route, for example. And so um, there are companies now with that data taking steps to try to help reduce that carbon footprint or do other things um, to try to help out. We'll show you some examples of that. So the first is what Volvo is doing. I know we say travel sector, but cars are part of travel as well. Um, and they are now capable of pulling over a driver who is driving irresponsibly, might be falling asleep or might be intoxicated. This is a test that's um, running right now, um, but in the next few years, Volvo intends to bring this technology to all the vehicles. Right, and one of the things that I love about this is this, this is not only good for a teenage driver, but for those of you that have uh, loved ones that you're sort of getting to the point where, gosh, I'm not sure if mom and dad should be driving. I mean, this is just a really nice way to sort of help people on their own make those decisions. So as Ron mentioned, there'll be certain steps here where initially there'll just be an alarm that'll go off, eventually a voice that's talking to you, and then uh, autonomously your car can be pulled over if your performance is deemed to be inappropriate. So I, I, I really love this trend. Yeah, again, so when we're talking about making a difference, companies and brands that are making a difference, we don't mean just in terms of global sustainability and, and carbon footprint. We are talking about lots of ways to enhance people's safety and well-being. And this is an interesting kind of transition between autonomous vehicles and self-driving vehicles. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Elon Languages um, is another company that's trying to help, and this is an example of a translation software for gender balanced um, resumes uh, or job postings. So by running your post through their filter, they change things like firemen to firefighter. firefighter, exactly. And actually Google Translate has recently acquired this technology and a lot of languages is making it available to them. Again, just trying to look for ways to intervene to make the world around us uh, a little bit better place. Pay attention to KLM. Um, they're doing a lot of interesting things. This is, um, a, as you know, a, an airline company, um, Royal Dutch Airlines. But what they did was they replaced one of the, they eliminated one of their flights between- Amsterdam and Brussels. That's it, Amsterdam yeah. and Brussels. Thanks, Roger. Sure. Um, and they replaced it with a high-speed train and said, look, um, you're, you can contribute to reducing CO2 emissions by taking a train instead and incentivize people to do that. So they famously took a uh, position last year and said, uh, do you really need to travel? Which is a pretty incredible thing for a hotel company to say. Um, and airline now, company. I'm sorry? Airline company. A airline company, yeah, sorry. It would be amazing for a hotel company to say it too. Um, so uh, just 
interesting to see what KLM is doing to try to incentivize people to ride on trains. And they're not the only ones, incidentally. We have some other examples. And they've developed a whole campaign called Fly Responsibly, too, which is really, I think, a smart, smart way for them to position themselves as a leader in the industry. And they added that cool tail fin to that high speed train. Exactly. Uh, as if it was, photo. won't go off the rail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we can move on. So, another train company trying to incentivize um, people to reduce their carbon footprint, Deutsche Bahn out of Germany, is a rail company. And they did something pretty incredible. They developed a, an algorithm that looked for photos of famous places that people are going to in other parts of the world that are expensive to get to from Germany, such as the Tower Bridge in London, and found with Google Image Search uh, that you could get to a similar kind of vantage point for an Instagram yeah. moment yeah. in Munich, uh, from Munich to Berlin, excuse 19 me, euros. for 19 euros yeah. instead of 201 euros, in order to incentivize people to uh, holiday domestically and to use trains uh, as an alternative to um, their trains, of course, as an alternative to flying right. across the country. We encourage you to visit this online. It's incredible. As, as you guys and ladies know who have seen us present before, we, we tend to love to have these presentations be layered with different videos, and we couldn't today. Uh, but this is just a very fascinating um, online experience because there are so many places that are very significant visually, and you think you're you know one place, but you're actually somewhere else. So explore it. I think you'll find it really fun and it might uh, take you on a, an adventure that helps you lower the carbon footprint of our world. So let's just stay for one second on what the implications might be for the hotel industry here. Uh, look, we all live in uh, cities and towns where there are hotels nearby. Uh, we often now are traveling across the world to meet, stay in hotels and meet people at their offices or at the hotels. Right. Perhaps hotels in a local community could facilitate meetings locally that are bridging hotels and people uh, who aren't local. Right, right. Um, so again, it's just taking a cue from um, kind of our travel situation right now around the world, but also from companies like Deutsche Bahn who are asking us to think differently. Love this next one. You want to talk about it? Sure, I do. So this is a Finnish uh, distillery uh, that's decided to get into the hotel industry and they're starting this resort called Arctic Blue Resort, it'll be open in 2020. And their whole idea is for people that come there, you can enjoy a beautiful, luxurious experience. And if you choose to opt into making your experience more green, they will discount your experience based on what you do. So if you use less electricity, you use less water, if you eat more sensibly, those are all things that will lower your rate. And then if you choose to plant a tree or two, a tree or two you'll be able to get another 5% discount on your rate. So this hotel will be open in 2022, and I, I really look forward to experiencing it. I think it's really smart. There's a lot that we can learn from it as it applies to our industry. Uh, I've been trying to get you to go to Finland with me for a long time. I know, so I'm going to finally have to do it. Yeah, exactly. So this idea of uh, reducing um, your impact on hotel, perhaps operations, you know, we're seeing that in the hospitality industry now, you know, refuse uh, housekeeping service and get some uh, additional credits. Credits, points. right, exactly. Uh, it's another thing to look at your consumption, not just your requirement for labor, but what it is you're consuming. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide, we'll show you. This is something that we've been thinking about for a while. We proposed in 2005 during the Hotel of Tomorrow initiative, or the HOT project, a room rate that was based upon your guest consumption. The truth is that we have um, lots of ways to measure the amount of energy or water or impact that an individual guest is actually having during their stay. And it wouldn't be long, we don't believe, before uh, this might be an opportunity to you know, incentivize you to take a shorter shower or uh, not power up that device that's already powered up. Right. But as we've talked about in other uh, presentations here at HEC, and these are things that are really nice because they're guest flexible. So you and Julie or even I could opt into that or opt that's out. That's my wife and his wife, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So that's a nice thing for you to sort of say, hey, I'm going to have one day fully premiumized and another day I'm going to give back a bit more. So I, I think those things that you can turn on and turn off the same way now right. we can choose to in a hotel to check in digitally, just go right to our room or, you know, have the experience of being greeted by somebody. This is, this is something that's going to take hold. Yeah, there have been a couple experiments, by the way, uh, run against this idea, um, one in Hawaii, one up in Canada, and we'd love to see uh, the next person to take on the challenge. We can advance to the next slide, thanks. 
So Delta Airlines, again, here now where we know more that the airlines are having an enormous impact on, uh, on, our, environment. on our environment and Delta is now pledging um, that they're going to commit a billion dollars to reduce, uh, yeah. to become carbon neutral, right, right, right. 2030. Yeah. yeah. And how are they doing that? They're doing that by not only enhancing their fleet in relationship to the quality of the planes and the efficiency of those planes, but they're taking a deep look at, you know, how much waste do they have on the planes? How much waste do they have at their individual offices, at the airports? They're taking a look at how efficiently they can turn over uh, food products as it relates to what they're feeding, not only their team members, but feeding uh, when you are fortunate enough to get some food on a plane, what they are actually feeding you. And uh, they also are taking a look at in relationship to the training that they're putting their people through using simulators even more than taking people up in the air. And they're really trying to do a holistic experience uh, in relationship to dealing with their carbon footprint. And I bet you they're gonna meet this goal because obviously this is something that's really important. And as you're seeing through many of the trends that we're sharing with you, a lot of these trends apply to doing good for the planet, but are also good for the industry and good for the shareholder. And I think this is a, a great example of that. Yeah, I'm not aware of any hotel companies making a similar claim. Uh, please, by the way, uh, at the end, you'll have our email addresses if you are aware of that and we've just missed it, please bring it to our attention. But that is quite a pledge uh, to make. Uh, again, it's data driven. So the data is now out there and so it's forcing some reconsideration of policy and we'd love to see that something similar happen in the hotel space. Okay, we can move on, thank you. I think this is our last example. Um, this is a company um, that, there. sorry? It's a, yeah, sorry. it's a UK based climate change charity called 1010 and they're creating an initiative that says that if you vacation, uh, companies are signing up to pledge that if employees vacation in a carbon neutral or carbon responsible way, right. taking trains, for example, um, that or boats. or boats, right, exactly, that they will, and the boat, boats need uh, help right, right now, Roger. Exactly. Um, they will uh, extend your vacation days by two days. Yeah. So like additional leave, other than days leave. Right, exactly. And so it's a way of, again, incentivize people to make good uh, travel decisions. We can move on to the next slide, thank you. So 74% of consumers believe that CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting for governments. And that's Edelman's recent uh, results of a survey. So again, we'll point this out only to say the responsibility is falling at a corporate level to step in where governments perhaps have um, not taken the lead. Uh, when the truth is, the companies themselves uh, may be quickest to implement change uh, for good anyway. But I, but I think we'd hope, too, that not only leaders, but individuals and at home, we'd all take uh, our, and pay attention. To sure. Understand that a lot of people, as we saw earlier, believe it's up to the companies to deal with this. But if we all address it, and it really doesn't have to impact the quality of our experience, too. That's what's so nice about this. If we, if we all do our, our small part here, we can truly improve this and still have a great hospitality experience. Oh, yeah. Um, moving on. So our next trend is code breakers. And again, this is asking enlightening brands um, to rewrite industry code in the name of purpose. We can advance, thank you. So here is actually the Chinese government, the Ministry of Ecology, making a commitment just earlier this year to announce reduction in single-use plastics. Um, the intent there is to ban all plastic. It's over time, it's up till 2025, but they're doing things like eliminating plastic bags, um, straws, um, recyclable bottles, um, and this is happening in restaurants and stores and, um, Again, uh, those of you who are watching it, China have been buying our, our recyclables and processing them there. Uh, then they stopped receiving our recyclables. And now um, there's a glut of amount of recyclables out there that, are, that have not been turned into secondary use plastics. And so they're actually, as a government, taking a stand. But let's look at some examples of companies taking a stand. Or in this case, a band. Coldplay, what did they do, Raj? In uh, 2019, they decided when they were releasing their album, as opposed to doing a world tour, that they were going to do a YouTube uh, showing of that first album. And within one week, they had 15 million views. And uh, it was incredibly successful for them as a band and also uh, obviously incredibly thoughtful to the environment and the trend that I think you're going to see more of. 
You know, it's interesting around this, those of you who are listening to XM radio or, or any getting your audio uh, through one of the online sources, it felt to me like Coldplay was actually getting more radio, radio play uh, as a result of this policy. And they're not the only ones who are saying that touring just, it just incurs way too much travel uh, for everyone coming to their concerts. It's really the, the, the impact on the environment. Right, but to their credit, altruistically, today, that's the way, you know, if you and I were rock stars, uh, which we're not, that's, that's how you make your money, you know, because- you By know, touring, yeah. By touring, yeah. so it is, it is definitely a decision that they're making to sort of say, hey, we've been, we are quite successful, we, there still are a lot of residuals, but they wanted to really score that they've got a tour today. Yeah, yep. Vogue magazine uh, in January this year decided to try to eliminate some of the costs associated with photo shoots, hired eight illustrators to do all of Gucci's new line, and then um, gave the uh, savings associated with that to help. Uh, oh, to, that Venice. So yeah, flooding. exactly. The flooding in Venice. Yeah. So um, you, you wouldn't necessarily think, I didn't think until we came across this trend, Raj, that uh, photo shoots would have so much impact, but the truth is, there's a lot of there are a lot of people on a crew uh, for multiple shoots, and that is air travel. So, uh, again, um, not to um, you know try to raise an alarm bell here. Uh, not that you raise an alarm bell. I think you raise an alarm flag or ring a bell. But um, but there are more companies that are saying, do I really need to travel? And certainly in today's world, and it's a uh, I don't want to, the success of our industry to suffer. We've always been resilient in the past, and I'm sure we will in the future. But all these little things actually make a difference, especially if you can take the savings and then apply it to help others in the local community. Well, I think what's interesting about this, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Ron runs our branding agency. Uh, this is a really nice tactile experience, too. And I think, you know, we are living in such a digital world. It's really nice to see things that are done by the hand as well. And uh, I think that was a really smart move on the magazine's part yeah. as well uh, to sort of take that position. Yeah. Let's go to Sweden, yeah. uh, where IKEA seems to always be doing something new and innovative. They just they're building a seven-story store right now, uh, where the top of the store is a park, a public park that's actually open when the store isn't even open, uh, and the top, the next two floors down are a Coors brand Joe and Joe. Uh, and then below that is an Ikea store with no parking garage. Really that. Can't imagine, it's, you know, assembly required. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So they have a delivery service using electric vehicles for those of you who are buying things larger than what you can carry. And they're hoping that many of their customers are gonna come by public transportation instead of driving a car. Let's go to the fashion company Theory who had already established a policy about sourcing their materials uh, and their fibers as responsibly as possible. They did it with wool first. Um, now they've committed to cotton. They've done it with linen. So more and more providers um, um, of uh, uh, fashion providers are looking for where are they sourcing the fibers or the thread, um, not, not just how can they reduce the the, the, the production, uh, implication of production um, and waste, but they're also looking to be as responsible as possible. Right, and they're gonna trace this ultimately using the blockchain. And for those of you again that have seen Ron and I present in the past, we've talked about that and you know how that's gonna be applied to not only our industry in relationship to digital commerce, but another big part of the blockchain is authentication. And I think that a large part of yeah. these trends we're talking about, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but to prove that you're actually doing it uh, is another uh, element, and I think the blockchain is going to make that more and more readily available. Yep. So, what's next here? Um, I guess the opportunity exists whether you're Coldplay or you're the Chinese government to take a stand and try to make a difference and bend the rules a little bit, change the code of an industry um, like Theory is doing in their sourcing, and like you say with blockchain. The opportunity we should ask ourselves, and we ask ourselves here, is how can we act differently? How can we change the way that you know, we're, we're you know, acting as a design firm and a branding agency and a development company and a procurement company? But, and hopefully all of you, I mean, that's obviously what we love to do about these presentations is we're giving you a lot of food for thought to take home to talk about with your families and also talk about in our industry and the businesses you work in that will you sort of say, gosh, that's an interesting trend. I, and I can now apply it to what I do. Right.
Exactly. So, um, so we try to answer, by the way, questions like why and why now. Um, so again, it's, it's why we put stats up like what Edelman's trust barometer is telling us these days that consumers are, don't just consider major institutions to be uh, ethical and competent at the same time. So uh, we know the trust barometer is falling in a lot of places. Let's look at our industry and say, how do we act both ethically and uh, with responsibly. competence responsibly at the same time? So our last trend uh, relates to unconsumption, which is an interesting idea. Raj, we know that status is in the, the status sphere, if you will, is one of the mega trends that we follow. Um, again, the, the goal is to, to, to be considered different than others out there. And one of the ways we can do it is by having exclusive uh, things uh, that we're able to enjoy that perhaps others aren't. And, but now it's being turned on its head. This idea of unconsumption rather than consumption is becoming a status symbol. So let's look at some examples of that. Um, All Nippon Airways, which is a Japanese air, airline, actually now has a thousand robots that you can utilize to travel on your behalf. Right. As your surrogate. As your surrogate. So uh, if you have almost a thousand kilograms of CO2 per passenger to go for uh, a flight, uh, you know, a, a, a flight from the U.S. to Europe. Um, could you instead send uh, someone as your surrogate, as 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 your robot uh, right. avatar to to take that trip? Or alternatively, two years ago when we did our VR uh, presentation and talked about you know the opportunities to use augmented reality, is would this be a nice thing for a grandparent to be able to travel with their grandchildren? because they're not in a position to travel. So I think this is an interesting trend and sort of takes FaceTime to the next level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's FaceTime on wheels. Um, so Ghani is another, uh, the fashion industry seems to be paying attention, I guess, is one of the things that, that we're trying to pass along to you. This is a luxury fashion brand who's using only recyclable fibers uh, and only uh, renting their clothes rather than um, selling their clothes. There is, if you guys uh, have seen the latest issue of National Geographic, there's a story I know that you read, Raj, about uh, how much fabric and uh, clothing are ending up in dumps these days. Yeah, uh, in 2017, 11.2 million tons, according to the EPA, ended up in dumps. So this is a wonderful concept because it's all recyclable fabrics, and then it's all uh, a, a basically a subscription service. So. You use the clothing, and then it gets turned to return, and then somebody else can use it. And much like um, the other clothing company we talked about earlier, the condition you return it is the kind of credit that they'll give you and allow you to continue to sort of get the best economic benefit for doing environmentally what's correct. And fashion today is changing so quickly, and it's obviously changes even faster for women. This is a wonderful opportunity to do something that's good for the environment, but also look your best whether you're at work or having fun. Well, the hotel industry can take a cue from that, right? No so think about things like Sheets and, and Terry. Um, you know, they're, they're, these, are, these, these should be recyclable products. Um, we, I think we, we also talked about uniforming. Uh, Could that be a similar situation? Right, there's a lot of poly used in that that's highly recyclable. Right. Um, so certainly uh, any new business people out there thinking perhaps what could new business could they start? There's your uh, potential pearl of wisdom there. Um, look for recycling and reusing. Let's move on to the next one. So another thing is uh, around on consumption is actually consuming alcohol. Uh, we know the statistics uh, are going down for alcohol consumption uh, over the past five years. Um, and there's also less sugar, less meat, et cetera. But, there, but in terms of alcohol consumption, uh, we're actually designing um, concepts that rely more on uh, non-spirited beverages. Adult-friendly beverages. Yeah, adult-friendly. And these, you, the Kin Euphorics actually give you a sense of euphoria similar to alcohol without having alcohol in them, um, which, again, I think these botanicals uh, – are allowing us to, to think beyond the conventional here. Um, but as we think about unconsumption, uh, we're also paying attention to people's um, kind of lifestyle habits like this. Well, we often talk about wanting to create desirable and differentiated experiences. And I think the reason a lot of 
men and women enjoy traditional cocktails is because of the art form of how that cocktail is being made. So if you can have that same art form in a non-alcoholic cocktail and have that connection with uh, that mixologist that's making that, it uh, makes a ton of sense. And then if it can be all that taste good and actually be good for you, I mean, man, that's, that's a nice trifecta. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a test case being run right now um, by a company called Lumidix, and this is a smart kitchen garbage can that is helping reduce food waste. So it's monitoring uh, the amount of waste that's going into the garbage. It's a Sing Singapore-based startup, and they're also, um, with sensors, grabbing imagery of what it is that's being wasted. So they're trying to cut down on waste. Tie it into the recipes. It's also a way to sort of see, you know, are the chefs and uh, sous chefs preparing things the way they're supposed to be. And uh, it, I think it's a very interesting sort of AI application that uh, also it has implications not only in the uh, kitchen, but potentially it could be used in the bar area as well. Yeah. Dub just launched a campaign in New York. Uh, maybe some of you guys have seen it. There's a vending machine, uh, Grand, Central. Grand Central Station, where you bring in any plastic and it dispenses uh, some of their product in a 100% recycled plastic container. So they're taking steps to say, not only are we trying to do good here by collecting those plastics and recycling for you, but they're promoting the fact that they're now generating um, you know, less waste themselves, exactly. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention on that last slide in terms of plastics and single-use plastics, uh, was it the China slide I meant to mention that that we are aware that Marriott and IHG have made a commitment to eliminate uh, single-use plastics by 2025. Hyatt is taking a, a stance on that as well and changed some of their policies. So we are seeing hotel companies, uh, certainly those are just small examples, but trying to you know, change some of their policies for their franchisees. Right. I think you know, what we're just saying is if somebody wanted to be as bold as KLM and, and really dive into it, there's an opportunity for leadership and I think an opportunity for financial success too. Yeah. That's the great thing about these trends. And speaking of success, this is a, a great example of a company that's using recycled bags to create speakers. I think approximately these 100 plastic bags in these uh, speakers and uh, they have great sound and, and doing the right thing by sort of creating a, a circular economy example. Yeah, this is a product, we can advance to the next slide. This is a product that Roger and I, um, this is a new material that was created and brought to market um, two years ago um, when Raj and I were in New York at a company called Material Connection, which is the world's largest library of new materials manufacturing techniques. And um, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that are looking to try to um, you know, act more responsibly in the production of the raw materials that are used to make goods. And then we took this, let's advance to the next slide, please, thank you. Um, and we use some of that thinking uh, on the new brand that we've been working on for the past year with Hilton, which is the Tempo brand. Uh, this is a summit that we ran with uh, over 35 manufacturers to introduce them to new materials and ask them to incorporate as many of those as possible into the furnishings and finishes of this new um, kind of unprototypically prototype brand that we're creating. So you are seeing the hotel industry, and this is my shout out to Hilton, but you are seeing the hotel industry saying, let's act responsibly in ways that we can. Let's um, work with vendors who are, who are taking a more responsible policy. And we as a company are facilitating that process in order to bring some new ideas to vendors to incorporate into these solutions. Right, and a further shout out, I mean, this is just a nice mashup of the bronze team helped coordinate for Hilton, where they brought together manufacturers, designers, hotel operators, executives, and individuals from Hilton to come up with these great ideas for the brand, and it was very successful summit. So, um, so what's next here as it relates to uh, this trend, you know, on consumption? Um, Look, there's, a, there's a, a growing level of conscientiousness is what we're saying. It isn't just what you buy or what you do, it's what you don't buy and what you don't do. And it seems to us that uh, this trend is only gonna continue. And so uh, we're asking everyone to consider the, their own kind of actions and the actions of their companies as it relates to um, consumption. Um, so in conclusion, if we move on, you know, these four trends of Sustain, we can move on to the next one, sorry. 
Thank you. This is double blink. Yeah, double blink here. Um, sustainability is a service. Uh, again, how can companies provide services um, that are helping people act responsible? Um, how can they, number two, intervene and create systems that are acting um, on consumer and guest behalf in order to make it even easier to, or not even make a decision with right. the Volvo example, just take action. Side rails. Yeah, exactly. It, code breakers is an opportunity to think differently about the code of your business and your industry. And then let's pay attention to unconsumption because uh, I think there's going to be more people kind of opting out of some decisions that they may, may have made historically. So moving on to the last slide, just a big thank you from me and from Raj uh, from Chicago, where you've watched the city come to life behind us. Um, we are always happy to hear from people, and you can reach Roger at the email there, rhill at gettys.com, and reach me at rswidler at gettys.com. Uh, we thank Cornell University and HEC for allowing us to participate. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid here. Go uh, Big Red! <laughs> uh, and thank you again for uh, our, uh, the opportunity to participate again this year. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, as I said, hopefully you'll invite us back. We'll be on the stage next year. And uh, I, as I started our presentation, I'm very confident that we're going to get through all this. And the industry is going to be even a, a better and brighter place. Uh, once we get past it, we're going to learn a ton from this and probably reflect on it in a way that's going to help future generations if they have to, have to deal with something like this be in a much better position. So let's hope. here's to the success of our industry and the success of all of you and anyone that happens to be watching this in the future. And thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. <laughs>